I didn't realize I actually had to go back um, to the page. So. <laughs> oh, no, 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 you're good. Um, so, as, you know, just as a general framework for what I'm going to be doing inside of this, I'm going to be bringing up um, quite a few points throughout the entirety of today's debate round. Um, but I'm just going to start off with three main lines of argumentation. And then I'll let you respond to those, then I'll respond to that and bring up more, and you can bring up more. So this is uh, more open than, than a typical formal debate, but I'll just respond to stuff here and bring up stuff here. So I'll start off with the first reason why universal health care is uh, not net beneficial. Um, net beneficial meaning that uh, there is more bad than good. Uh, you are arguing that there is more good than bad, obviously. Um, so the first reason why universal health care is, is overall not a good thing is because of the excessive waiting periods. Uh, and again, also, as a general note, I'll be posting every you know source that I cite in the comment section after the debate round, um, so you can look it over for yourself. Um, but this is from a website that says, quote, at the very second, one million Canadians are waiting for medically necessary procedures, unlike in America, where simple procedures can be performed within just a few days from the initial appointment. Canadian patients are put at the bottom of an extensive waiting list, uh, and they're expected to wait an approximate 9.3 weeks to see a specialist. If you think that's bad, in 2016, patients needing to see a neurosurgeon waited an utmost of 46.9 weeks. To some patients, this is a death sentence, end quote. Now, a lot of the reasons for this isn't expanded on inside of this point necessarily. I'll expand on why this is a thing inside of my next later speeches, but what we know right now is that there are excessive waiting periods, um, and I'll expand on why the, those waiting periods happen inside of later speeches with further subpoints. Um, and then the second point is that it's not free. This is a common misconception a lot of people have with universal healthcare is that you're you're getting free healthcare. This is simply not the case. You're in a, you're you're going to end up paying about the same price that you do for healthcare currently under universal healthcare in taxes. Taxes would raise exponentially higher. We'd be, you know you'd be slammed in taxes to be able to pay for universal healthcare. You'd end up paying the exact same amount with a lot less control over what you can and cannot get inside of your plan. And then the third and final thing that I'll bring up just very briefly here is that it's it's just overall unfair. Um, to quote from the same website as earlier, whether you're an active smoker, a drinker, or, 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 or active or obese, you are treated equally in the universal health care system. The system does not require people to take responsibility for their poor life choices, and because of this, illnesses that are considered to be preventable are draining the system of millions and millions of dollars every single year and delaying others from receiving the metal, medical treatment they require. With an aging generation and increasing, and increasing medical care needs, countries that have implemented a government-run healthcare system have spent over 40% of their yearly budget, 40% on healthcare alone. Excuse me. This requires funding for education, military, and the environment to be reduced immensely. Excuse me. So with those basic points in mind, um, as for how I'm going to be arguing this round, I'll pass it back to you and you can make your preliminary arguments. Great, thanks. Yeah, so um, I agree with the definition that beneficial basically on the whole does more harm than good in your case and more good than harm in my case. Um, I'll be arguing universal coverage does has three main principles. It's equitable, it's accountable, and it's well funded by the government. Um, and then just more broadly, political, economic, and um, healthcare benefits of a universal healthcare system. Um, I've had to Google a few things around the ACA, just being an Australian in terms of the comparison there, but I, um, from my sort of um, context, I know most about the Australian universal healthcare system and how that works. So I'll be using that as a model to address many of the harms, I guess, <laughs> you've brought up in terms of wait times. Um, That's fine. And um, the, the, the cost basically and um, the 40% of government expenditure and how it can be more efficiently managed. Um, so I guess I'll do, do my layout as well. Um, so basically I think that uh, it, it, what a private healthcare system does is it ensures equity and access to healthcare services. So that, that means that everyone who needs them should get them, not only those who can pay for them. Um, to the extent in which I do realise that necessarily you do pay taxes and that's the model that I think is best, that it isn't free, you know, reductio. Um, I think that it well offsets the cost uh, that otherwise would be incurred by people going down private healthcare insurances. But also part of that taxation does go towards incentivizing people to the private sector to ease the burden off the government. Um, so for the context of this debate, I won't be arguing like a full um, socialist argument, which is that everything should be provided by the centre state, rather that healthcare should be socialised with private health insurances to address many of the um, inadequacies in terms of wait times and excessive uh, costs and things like that. Um, I'd just put the question to you, is that, is that okay um, in terms of, can I stand for a debate which is, you know, a private and a um, mostly government funded sector? Um, I, I feel like that's particularly fair. I wasn't under the impression that you'd be arguing for socialism. Um, 
I, I'd be under the impression that you're arguing for a socialized healthcare system, which I think is sort of what you're saying. So I don't think there's any contest there. Great. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Just to clear it up um, yeah. in terms of like uh, just the way that it works in the UK, Australia and Canada. Um, I think that's some fairer things there. Um, so I'll, I'll go into the principles a bit more broadly later, but in terms of the actual arguments, um, in terms of under healthcare, basically you get um, just better access to healthcare. That means that more people are um, able to go to hospitals more quickly. In fact, um, into, like I'll dispute the wait time argument, but also just net benefits in terms of countries that have universal healthcare in terms of infant mortality or life expectancy do improve. Um, more broadly that economically things like medication becomes cheaper and there actually is some sort of re reduction in cost for insurance companies that um, under a universal healthcare system because the government provides incentives for people to go to the private industry as well, while still um, covering the, the poorest in society. And thirdly, just how politics, a smaller point, but how it does promote um, people to vote for good leaders. Like in Australia, um, you know, our most popular prime minister was one who did introduce universal health care, similar in UK and in Canada, um, and to some extent Obamacare, although that is quite touch and go. Um, so that's my setup. Um, if you want to start your first argument and we can get um, some discussion going there, then yeah. All right, sweet. So I'll sort of make my first argument in response to your equit equitability argument. Um, that sort of ties into one of the points that I was preparing for. I have sort of three separate responses to an equitable argument that you made inside of your last speech, talking about how everybody has equal access to health care, about how the wait times are down. I have three separate empirical examples of healthcare systems where socialized medicine took place. Actually, four separate examples. One of the examples is tied into the other. So four separate empirical examples of where socialized medicine took place and the wait times were dramatically Worse. I'll start off with uh, the Canadian healthcare system. You said that you contested that, um, but you know, obviously, you're going to bring up evidence inside of your next speech. But as of right now, that point still stands. Um, I'm assuming that you do have evidence against that, but you know, um, as of right now, it still stands. But obviously, you will contest that later. So I'll bring up the other ones just for the sake of bringing them up. Um, the second one is that of the NHS, which is um, uh, the Britain's version of of socialized medicine. And this is to quote from Imperial College Professor Brian Jarman in 2013. He had a study that found that death rates in the National Health Service, or NHS, in the UK were 45% higher than in American hospitals. A large number of those deaths could have been avoided, according to London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, which concluded that 750 patients a month, or 1 in 28, die from a lack of care or mistakes that could have been prevented within the NHS. This is without mentioning the shortages in workers, with the number of nurses declining by 50% between 2000 and 2014. The UK is not alone in this. Canada and the Scandinavian countries, again, going back to Canada and then the other, next one, Scandinavian countries, have experienced very similar problems, even with extremely high taxes and an abundance of natural resources that fuel their economy. So the point behind this is very clear, which is that because of socialized medicine and the government involving itself in medicine, the overall quality uh, of medicine does not actually go up, as you claimed, it actually ends up going down. And then I'll look again at the, affordable hair, uh, at the Affordable Care Act, looking at America. I don't have any exact statistics on this, but since the Affordable Care Act has gone into place, the overall quality of the American healthcare system has dropped dramatically. Um, and so um, I'll pass that back to you and then you'll sort of respond to that and I'll guess I'll bring up other, further arguments a little bit later. Yeah. Sure. Um, yes, yeah, so, so in terms of the equal access to healthcare um, and the waiting time argument, I'll, I'll address that first response and then I'll do the um, NHS stuff. Um, on, on that first argument, Basically, the way that I have interpreted this topic to be net beneficial is that it means that on a whole that more people can access that um, healthcare in the first place. So even if waiting times are excessive, which I'll, 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 still, I'll still dispute that fact, that the fact that more people can opt into that system is still a net benefit rather than a system in which um, private healthcare insurance is quite expensive, as I, as I know the case to be um, in the US, for example. But on that um, actual argument in terms of the the waiting times. Um, the way that uh, it works is that medical emergencies, such as like people that have come quite ill with flus and things like that, uh, severe flus, can go straight into a public healthcare system. And like the waiting times there are something like, you know, six to eight hours. Um, that is quite excessive, I understand. But in terms of the actual access, it isn't dependent on your wallet or on the quality, like on, on your sort of healthcare plan in the first place. Um, so uh, in terms of medical emergencies, those things are well accounted for within a universal healthcare system system. Um, in terms of the, the, the wait time that you brought up, I imagine that's referring to sort of surgeries or um, 
uh, more, you know, elective operations and things like that. Those things do have a, a have a wait time, as they do in the private sector as well. Um, the, the sort of burden of resources that is, you know, more people in the public sector, it does jam that up. Probably suggests you should have more funding for the public sector. But even without that public funding, there are still wait times that exist in the private hospital system. But on the whole, um, it's basically an alternative in which pub, uh, poor people can wait for or have a wait time for surgeries that aren't you know life-threatening which is regrettable but it's something that they still have access to whereas under the private healthcare insurance system if people do have private health insurance they do get that quicker access to private health or in the worst case scenario uh, like that's basically the best case scenario for people that can afford private health scenario so at worst you do have wait times for non-essential surgeries but at the best case you can get these uh, these methods done straight away um in terms of the NHS uh, scandal uh, sort of thing, uh, again, that those seem to point towards a lack of government funding and oversight in in, in our model of universal healthcare. Um, those those sort of private uh, private industries could potentially deal with those in a better way, but so could the government. I think that stands under both sides of the house there. Um, in terms of the actual uh, like kind of care approaches necessarily the government because of its fact that it does have a, a larger burden many people do opt into the private health insurance but as i, I as i said this, the burden that i'm standing behind is one in which more people get access to that health care even if at times that health care is um you know not as good as a private industry would provide um basically with those things there in yeah do you want to respond to those so we can yeah. go forward um, before I respond, I have a quick question for you. You are aware that America's healthcare system is not totally free. It's very he heavily regulated, not not quite to the extent of socialized medicine, but it is very heavily regulated, right? Yeah. Okay, just just making sure we're on the same page there. With that in mind, I'll move into a couple of responses that I have mm -hmm. to some of the stuff that you said. Um, in response to my NHS point, I'll start off with that. I'll start at the bottom of the flow and work up. The response to my NHS point was that in this instance, it's because of a lack of funding. And I have two separate responses to this. The first one is that there's there's no warrant for this. Again, no warrant. There's no reason to suggest that a lack of funding would have prevented this. If it, uh, if you, in fact, if you look at other instances, a lot of free market healthcare systems or less regulated systems like America a couple years ago would have been able to solve this. And they aren't funded to the same extent that current systems are. So it's not an issue of funding. And secondly, if it is an issue of funding, there simply isn't enough money to do this. People get taxed an insane amount of their income to support socialized medicine and to support free health care for all. You're, you're taxed an insane amount of your money. And I'll, in a second, in later points, I'll move into how much it would actually cost Americans. Um, I know that like we're, you're not an American, but like uh, I'll move into like uh, if if America wanted socialized medicine, how much it would actually cost each person is an sure. insane amount of your money that would be taken away in, uh, to go into socialized medicine. Then moving into your waiting time point, your response to my waiting time point was that uh, it, more people can overall access healthcare. You said that if you have you know terminal illnesses, like you know you've been shot or something, you get moved up to the top of the waiting list. And you said it's still like eight to nine hours. Um, and I have four separate responses to this. The first one is that this is not net beneficial. Again, not net beneficial. In a less regulated market, that wait time isn't eight to nine hours. You get into the emergency room in like 10 to 15 minutes. If you come in with like, you know, dehydrated from the flu, you'll get into the emergency room and you get the treatment that you needed. Even in America with a heavily regulated market, emergency room wait times are like 40 minutes. There's, I, I drive to go to my grandparents' house and to go to my debate club once a week. And as I'm driving down the interstate, there's a sign for a medical center that shows the emergency room wait time. I have never seen it go over an hour. Eight to nine hours sounds like a small amount of time, but for somebody that has a serious illness, eight to nine hours is a death penalty. It, that's going to kill a lot of people. And in fact, we've seen that through the example of NHS. It does kill people. There are plenty of illnesses and injuries that are preventable and could be treated, but because of the fact that the wait times are so long and because of the fact that you know, they, they, they aren't as good as a free market system and the healthcare itself is not of a, as high of a quality as a free market system, people start dying. Um, and then my second response is that six to eight hours is a death penalty. Um, you know, it sounds like a small amount of time, but it's actually, you know, somebody that's been shot, that is a pretty bad thing. Um, and then my third response is that you said it's still not beneficial because people are getting in. And my, my response is that people aren't getting in though. You can say that it's not beneficial because people get in regardless of the quality of the care itself, but that's the thing. That's my point. The care is bad and you can't even get the care in the first place. So it might take a six to eight hours to even get in there. And when you get in there, the character, the, the, excuse me, the, the treatment is bad. So there's two problems inside of this, inside of just this one argument inside of universal health care. And then my fourth response 
Fourth response is of another empirical example, and that's the story of Charlie Gard. You've probably heard of him if you've if you've looked at the news in the past couple of years. Um, this is another. This is really what threw NHS and the problem inside of it into the national spotlight. Um, so as people woefully witnessed during the horrific, this is to quote from a website again, as people wo woefully witnessed during the horrific Charlie Gard case in Britain, if the government foots the bill for health care, then government gets the final say. And this is really one of my fundamental issues with healthcare, which is that by, by putting socialized medicine in place, you wouldn't, it, it takes the ability to decide what happens from the individual and puts it in the place of the government, what's best for the collective body as the whole. Um, Sanders claims that this article was looking at Bernie Sanders' universal health care plan. Um, Sanders claims that the new system will be simple and free Americans of having to haggle with insurers, but that's a lie. Instead of haggling with insurers whom they always threat whom they, whom they can always threaten to leave, Americans will now have to force to fight with government bureaucrats for their medical needs. To quote government uh, to quote from national uh, to quote from the National Enquirer, it says, quote, government officials can government officials cannot control the demand for medical services. They can only control the supply of medical goods and services. Mm -hmm. In practice, this means that government officials must determine what kind of care patients get, how they get it, under what circumstances they get it, and how those services will be well, they will be priced. They don't negotiate prices; they fix them. Uh, to further the quote, the Medicare program, with its tens of thousands of pages of rules and regulations and guidelines, demonstrate the painful fact to any Medicare patient struggling with a Medicare claims denial, or any doctor or any medic medical professional wrestling with Medicare Medicare paperwork. Meanwhile, forget personal freedom. So that's really one of my main issues against socialized medicine is that it takes a lot of the you know, the ability to decide what happens in, in healthcare uh, and, and in your own medical treatment for your child and for yourself away from you. And taking personal liberties away as I as the pro and, and I as a person feel that this is not something that should be considered acceptable. So with that in mind, I'll pass it back to you. Cool, okay, so um, sort of two main thrusts from that, that still on the accessibility line. Um, and secondly, uh, the, the broader principle of liberty and the kind of choices that take place under a universal healthcare system. Um, firstly, onto the, the healthcare, um, uh, uh, you know, so the access and wait times, my eight to nine hour figure was, that was that's the sort of most extreme end of uh, non-urgent things at hospitals. The majority of wait times, um, I could probably find a statistic on this, is, is sort of like, you know, it, it, it takes a place in um, sort of general practitioner surgeries here where you can ring up, go in, see, see a specialist within the hour in many cases. Um, I, can, I can verify that with statistics, but just from my empirical sort of access with the healthcare system, that's how it works. Um, and basically the system in terms of that individual choice, you can go in there um, and claim it all on your Medicare benefits, in which case it is bulk billed. Um, that means that you do not have to pay for that service. It is something um, other than, you know, the government sort of taxes in a way, um, in the same way that we do pay for usage for roads or for um, education and things like that as well. Um, but you, I guess I'm sort of addressing more the liberty argument here as well. But what a universal healthcare system does when you do have a dual sector that is public healthcare system completely free or um, heavily subsidized and a private sector is that it actually does reduce the burden on those insurance companies to offer um, exchange programs. So I, I know that under the ACA, um, again, I'll provide statistics for this later, but basically there's like an insurance exchange that is set up amongst like states were required to set up an insurance exchange, which does promote sort of competitive pricing between those companies. So at the point in time you're making healthcare cheaper for individuals or private healthcare cheaper for individuals, that lessens the burden on the state. More people can access the state services while also, you know, retaining the benefit that you claim of having um, a more efficient public um, private sector. So I guess the, my main thing there with that, with that argument of individual choice is that it actually increases the choice that people have because you do have the chance for individuals to go into hospitals and surgeries and pay um, nothing, but at the same time, in, in, in which case they do have that sort of extra income or in, in, in what Australia we have, you know, benefits for veterans, um, for seniors, uh, and for, for extremely low income people, uh, they can also, you know, it's heavily subsidized for them. Surgeries are like 85% paid for in, in, in a lot of cases up to, you know, it's completely paid for, but you do also um, have incentives to get cheaper private health insurance because yes, the wait times are less in a private hospital. That is due to the fact that there are a few people using those private hospitals. Um, and I guess in terms of the funding argument as well, just done a quick Google search, Luxembourg spends, um, I think, yeah, a huge 7% uh, um, of their expenditure on GDP, um, but, but gross 
amounts is quite high and they do have like you know one of the largest life expectancies in the world more empirically as well just looking at evidence here from the uhc um that says uh, just a moment i'll scroll up um that effectively in brazil uh, infant mortality rates since they put uh, a, a system of um universal health care in place have actually reduced quite significantly since 1988. Um, so it fell from, and also fell from 46 per 1,000 live births in 1990 to 17 per 1,000 live births in 2010. So those things are, are, are instrumental to a universal health care system that you do have that broader access to the public things. Um, and while, yes, um, I understand the NHS has had scandals with, with infant mortality and, and, and that, that's the case that you brought up before, uh, um, in terms of the net beneficiality, I guess, of those two systems, one in which the, the amounts are significantly lessened with a few of the harms that do come from people that, um, you know, th that are getting the best conditions is better than not having that access at all. Um, so I, I guess at the end of that, the sort of access argument, yes, there are some harms that come from a universal healthcare system that, that are lessened in a private healthcare system. But at the point in time in which you have people dying on the streets or not getting any medical attention at all, it is better for them to go to those systems with the sort of um, downside of having that um, uh, quality decrease in a way. But also uh, in Australia, we do have a thing called the Medicare levy. So our healthcare spending per GDP is like nine to 10% around that mark. But also for high income earners, they pay 1% of their GDP in terms of, um, sorry, 1% of their, their income earnings into a, a levy fund, which goes towards subsidizing Medicare and things like that. But they also do get rebates in their private health insurance. They So that 1% is offset by benefits and cheaper health insurance plans that they get. So it necessarily does make it more affordable, even if they are paying more out of their pocket to subsidize these services for, for poor individuals. So I guess that's my main argument in terms of how it helps the economic policy there. But um, another point that I found quite interesting researching um, Obamacare was the removal of lifetime limits from healthcare insurance companies. So people that were chronically ill could now uh, claim a multiplicity of different injuries or, or treatments in their lifetime from an insurance policy as opposed to the scenario like five years ago where that couldn't happen. Um, and I guess one thing I also wanted to mention as well, just a bit of an aside, I think um, despite Trump's, you know, vehement sort of disapproval of Obamacare, the fact that he did say that Australia's healthcare system was probably better than America's is something that I think does carry a lot of weight in this debate in terms of that it, it can net provide a political argument. I'll, I'll go into that after you um, respond. Okay, um, so I'll sort of respond to a couple of things that you brought up, and then I'm going to get, uh, I'll respond to the liberty argument, your response to my liberty point, and then I'm going to bring up a separate point, sort of compartmentalizing the three things that I talked about at the start and expanding upon that more. I'm going to be talking about the physical costs of a universal healthcare system and why overall that's not a good thing. It'll sort of tie in with the liberty argument and, exp and, and sort of hammer that argument home. So let's first start off with a response that you brought up talking about how, you know, you can claim it all in your uh, Medicare benefits or you can pay out of pocket inside of the Australian healthcare system. I believe that was the argument we were trying to make. Um, but my response to this is, that was in response to the Charlie Gard argument. But my response is that's exactly what Charlie's parents tried to do. It, it was widely publicized that they were trying desperately to pay out of pocket. They weren't even trying to use, you know, to use Medicare or any of this stuff to pay for Charlie's health insurance and to, to keep him alive. They were trying, willing to pay out of pocket, out of their own money that had already been stricken by taxes, mind you. They were willing to pay their own money to try and keep him alive. But because of the fact that the government now has an invested interest in healthcare and an invested interest in keeping their asset and their investment stable, they, they let the kid die. Like, like they, I'm pretty sure they eventually were able to keep, they like sent him to America and then he died in America after receiving treatment or something. I, I don't, I, I never saw the end of the story. Mm -hmm. However, what I do know is that Britain absolutely 100% refused to, to grant him treatment, even though the parents were trying to use their own personal liberty and their own money without any government interference to try and do it. But because the, the minute that the government becomes invested in healthcare and in a private industry, they have a stake in that and they have to protect their investment and their stake. And when they see something that they don't see as financially lucrative or overall lucrative to that investment, regardless of the personal in impacts of it, they're just going to stop it. And that's that's what we see all the time. There are several cases even in America. Um, I, I, I forgot to write them down. I probably should have done that. There are several cases even in America of where stuff like this has happened. And we don't even have a socialized healthcare system. I probably should have looked up stuff for Australia too. Um, mm -hmm. I, I really only touched on Canada, Britain, and, and the United States. It's a little bit shallow of me. but um, So I apologize for that. 
that's why I'm not talking about Australia all yeah. that much. Um, yeah. But I feel like the the overall plans can sort of correspond with each other because they're all universal health care. Um, and you also brought up inside of the last part of your speech about how people dying on the streets is 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 worse than and not is worse. Um, going to a universal health care system and receiving lower quality care is better than people dying on the streets. My response to that is, is that it's true, but living in a free market system, a truly free market system, and that's honestly what I would propose, mm -hmm. I, I would say get rid of all most of the regulations that we have on health care and let competition take over, sort of like, you know, you go to buy a refrigerator, there's multiple different refrigerator providers, you can pick the best one. Right now, there's really only like two or three providers that you can go to in America who isn't socialized, but in a socialized system, there's like one or two that you can go to. Um, and then that, that, so talking about people dying on the streets, uh, there, but in, in a truly free market system, that, that, that's really not the case because America has had that in the past. We've had a free market system that, that isn't as heavily regulated and people just weren't dying on the streets. If that were the case, then I feel like a lot of people would have flooded to universal health care a lot quickly, a lot more quickly. But that, that's simply not the case. People will just weren't dying on the streets. That's an argument that I hear made a lot, and that's simply not true. Um, then moving into the response, um, you sort of brought up the, the line that Barack Obama gave a couple years ago. That was, if you like your health care provider, you can keep it. That was sort of something that you that you said a second ago. Not 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 exactly, but you talked about how there was a lot of opportunities to receive a health care provider that you like. But mm -hmm. I sort of have a response to that, which is a, a point that I that I wrote in advance that I was going to bring up on my own, but I'll just bring it up here, um, which is if you like your health care plan, you absolutely cannot keep it, um, period. E uh, to quote again from the Washington, uh, no, not, not from the Washington Post. I'm going to quote the Washington Post later, but to quote from the Daily Wire, even under Obamacare, private health insurance still remains. That would officially be over should Medicare for all program become the law of the land. Unless you happen to fall into upper income brackets and can afford your own private insurer, you will, so like literally owning the company, which like nobody does, um, you'll, you'll, you'll be forced to grovel at the feet of Uncle Sam for all of your health care needs. Here's how the Washington Post gleefully frames it. Quote, the bill would revolutionize America's health care system, replacing it with a public system that would be paid for by higher taxes. Everything from emergency surgery to prescription drugs, from mental health to eye care, would be covered with no copayments. Americans younger than 18 would immediately obtain universal Medicare cards, while Americans not currently ed eligible for Medicare would be phased into the program over four years. Employer-provided health care would be replaced with the employers paying higher taxes, but no longer on the hook. For insurance so let's talk about those higher taxes that's the argument that i was going to bring up in a second mm -hmm. how much are we actually increasing the taxes um so first is that will it will dramatically increase payroll taxes um here's a helpful tip anytime a politician says free just immediately add a couple few percentages to your tax bracket mm -hmm. and that would absolutely be the case in, in bernie's plan uh, the articles that i'm talking about are examining bernie's plan by the way so that's yep. why i'm mentioning bernie's plan a lot which calls for a 7.5 percent payroll tax on employers and a 4% income-based premium on all Americans. Sanders made a similar, albeit much more modest proposal of 6.2 payroll tax increase last year. And according to a 2016 analysis uh, of that proposed by Emory, Emory University professor Keith Thorpe, the payroll tax would reduce wages. To quote from him, quote, the new tax burden would vary dramatically by income. Low income working families would pay 2.2% of taxable income and face a 6.2% reduction in wages traced to the employer payroll tax. Individuals and families earning over $250,000 would face a 40% increase, 40% in taxes to finance the plan and pay for most of the new cost of the plan. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, looking at these statistics, and I'm bringing it up inside my next points, uh, the payroll tax and the, that slight increase isn't even enough of money. It isn't even enough. It isn't even enough money, excuse me, which leads me into my second point about the cost, which is that it will cost trillions. Again, it will cost trillions. The estimated, again, estimated, um, initial costs, and the reason I say estimate is because it's it's been years before it, it, it that it was taken before years of inflation is projected at 2.5 trillion per year, which would create an average of over one trillion per year financing shortfall. According to Thorpe, that means the projected cost does not match the revenue stream, which in turn will require higher than even a 7.2 percent payroll tax. To quote from Thorpe again, to fund the program, payroll and income taxes would have to be increased from a combined 8.4% in the Sanders plan to 20%, while all retaining all remaining tax increases on capital gains, increased marginal tax rates, the estate tax, and eliminating tax expenditures. 
So it's just getting more and more crazy how much money a truly effective and a truly, you know, a good healthcare system is actually going to take. This is an insane amount of money. And from a principal standpoint, this is not acceptable. And I'm going to be going over the points again, why from a principal standpoint, just briefly, and then I'll pass it back to you. First, it costs a lot of money. We've established that. From mm -hmm. a principal standpoint, that's not acceptable for two reasons. One, it's not good to spend a lot of people's money just from a principal standpoint. The government has no right to take that much money away from us. Um, and then second is that high costs mean price control. We've seen that in the example of Charlie Gard. And then as I pass it back to you, um, this will be the, like the last thing that I say inside of the speech. I'd like to look at the the uh, I'd like to look at something called the Laffer curve. If you watched the debate that I did last night, I don't know if you did. Did you watch the debate I yeah. did last night? Yep. Okay. The Laffer curve is something that that it, uh, so if you take zero percent of, of of a tax rate from somebody, the government government makes zero dollars, right? Mm -hmm. So as you go up, it curves sort of like this. As you go up and start taking more taxes, people start making you, you, the government starts making more money. But you know, using the the rule of uh, uh, of diminishing value, as you go down and as you start taxing people more money, you'll eventually start making less money because people stop working. So that's why taxing somebody 100% of the uh, of their income yields the same amount as taxing somebody 0% of their income. That's you know why communism happens. That's why you have to have communism because if you don't have if you tax somebody 100% of their income, they're just going to stop working, which means you have to implement communism. I'm not saying that you're advocating for communism by the way. That's just you know how how mm -hmm. taxing that's just how taxation works. If you tax somebody 100% of their income, they're going to stop working. We've seen this historically, which means you have to force them to work, which which is communism. I'm not saying you're doing that. But just to point out, taxing people an insanely high amount of their money is shifting far to the right on the Laffer curve. We had, if you watched the debate last night, I don't know if you saw the whole thing, but we had a long discussion about, you know, where that sweet spot on the Laffer curve is. And we sort of came to the consensus that it's most definitely not to the two extremes. It's definitely not like a 5% tax rate, and it's definitely not like a 70 or 80% tax rate, which is what the, uh, which is what universal health care would call for and what universal health care does call for. If you look at Scandinavian countries, I, I believe they get taxed something like 70 percent of their income to fund for things like public transportation. Like a lot of people don't even own cars in that country because of the fact that they get taxed so much of their money. And people are like, well, yeah, that, that, that's OK because they have public transportation. But from a principal standpoint, I don't think that that is OK, because if somebody wants to have the ability to buy a car instead of going on government funded public transportation, that generally speaking is not a good thing. They should have the right to do that. That. And because of that, universal health care is not that beneficial. All right. Yeah. Um, so uh, lots of things there. Um, oh, sorry. The, the Bernie uh, sort of argument. Uh, again, that's probably, uh, I understand it to be a single payer system in that we, you know, we, we wholly, the government wholly funds every single sort of you know, medical procedure. Um, of course, that's as you said, that is going to cause a massive increase in taxes. That's the thing that happens in Cuba, for example. Uh, necessarily, Cuba does have very good um, healthcare qualities of control. Um, but given that the, the, the world that we live in isn't on that extreme end of things, um, the, the universal healthcare that I'm talking about is like a tax-based financing. So that is what you see in Australia, in the UK, in Germany, and things like that. Um, there, was, there was an article I was reading earlier that, that basically pointed out as well that the net sort of quality of healthcare in Australia and the UK was better, significantly better than the US, and only sli and slightly better than Canada. Um, I understand as well that Canada's universal healthcare system has only just been implemented. Perhaps it's like a switchover period. Not too sure there. But on the whole, these these things are, are better off. Um, so with the Bernie Sanders thing, like, yes, I agree that those tax rates going up is probably not an excellent thing, particularly to those, those highest degrees, although that's not the universal healthcare model that I'll be proposing. But in the, in, in the event that, like, you know, if America went down a completely nationalised path, that probably could work, given that there's, you know, very free market um, approach in America. I, I don't think that's a likely sort of thing that should, that should come up in terms of tax, rate, uh, tax rates. Um, I've just in, in the meantime as well looked up sort of waiting time um, here and, and there's a little uh, statistic from the Commonwealth Fund which says that in Germany 76% of people get a same day or next day appointment. In Australia that's 58% of people whereas in the US that system is 48%. Canada does lag behind at 41%. Uh, again I, I probably don't know the structural reasons for that but on the whole the vast majority of universal healthcare countries have that quicker access to healthcare. Um, I'll post that um, now. Uh, in terms of the budget spending argument as well, that it does radically increase uh, the deficit, for, for the website balance, thebalance.com um, says that, it, that Obamacare would lower the budget deficit by $143 billion according to Congressional Budget Office. It does this by reducing the government's healthcare costs, raising taxes on some businesses and high-income families, and thirdly, it shifts the burden to pharmacy companies and healthcare providers. Um, 
I, I think that speaks for itself. <laughs> uh, if you want to have a discussion about tax, it's probably an, an, another thing there. Um, but in and of itself as well, what a free market more principally uh, a free market approach does is that you sort of get the things that are, that occur with like Martin Shkreli and like medication being priced out of the market quite heavily. That's why countries like India, which do have um, sort, of, sort of government subsidized medications, you can buy things for like $2.50. Same goes in Mexico. Those sort of medications are, are, are funded by the government, which for the, the average person, which makes it net beneficial, is more affordable. Yes, if you're middle class or upper class, you can afford those medications in any world. But on the large part in Australia, because we, uh, like using an example here, if you're a middle income person, diabetes or heart medication costs like $30, a box um, but if you are a veteran if you're low income um, you can get that same medication for three dollars fifty which is really like a pittance out of like a welfare statement I, I don't I think that sort of thing occurs in America I can maybe look for some statistics on that um, again with a, uh, an another argument in terms of the safety thing going back to right to the start of the debate um, the telegraph here reports that um, the NHS has had to pick up the pieces a lot of the time with the private industry. Um, I guess this is another response to Charlie Gar, but like that was, you know, a very tragic scenario, what happened in that in that case. But it was also an incurable sort of illness that that in uh, under either side, the uh, a private healthcare, the best, you know, medicine, the best private insurance and all that, probably his death would have occurred um, in the same way. Uh, and here it says something like 2,600 patients have been transferred um, as emergencies from the private sector to the public sector. Um, under in the UK, which points to structural issues with private health insurance in um, UK. Um, so, so I guess basically my main contention there is with Bernie Sanders' proposal that necessarily doesn't have to be as expensive as it does in terms of what Obamacare or in Australia, as I said before, it's it's like 10% of the GDP and then high income earners play a supplement of one to 2%. Um, and, and I think for the, for the massive broad benefits that you do get in like things like infant mortality, life expectancy, the UN report, um, you, sorry, the UHC report I put in the comments does highlight those benefits and far outweighs the sort of um, allocation of resource arguments that exist, particularly do, when you do get a better choice in insurance companies. Like, uh, as, in, as I said, in Australia, those uh, it, it has made private health insurance cheap because governments do have an incentive to lower their costs. Healthcare is a big cost. So they provide rebates and things like that to go to private health companies to liberalise the market a little bit. I, I don't think that's a regrettable thing in this debate. Um, um, and finally, I think that that medication point is quite a big one as well. I would like to see how a free market system com competitively prices medication because I know that it, that it is heavily subsidised um, under universal healthcare systems. And that's just like a sort of day-to-day -day net good thing that you can do when you want to buy like Panadol at the shops, um, that's paracetamol uh, and things like that, that, that can help because I know that those things are more affordable. Um, and even things like subsidising specialist surgeries in Australia on average 85% of specialists are, are covered by Medicare. I, I believe in America that cost is a lot harder, for, a lot higher for specialists. Um, and uh, yeah, so so basically I think those are my main contentions. Um, if you want to quickly address anything that I've said um, before we wrap up, then yeah, that'd be good. Okay, um, would you want to have another time to respond to stuff? Because if not, then I'll just use up the remaining time and make my final arguments. Would you like to have time to respond to something, or do you just want me to use the rest of the time? Um, yeah, another time's fine, yeah. So okay, wait, sorry, I, I didn't quite what you were saying. Would you like to respond? Yeah, yeah. Okay, sweet. So I'll, I'll stop with about like four or three minutes left. Excellent. I'll just make my final voting issues and then let you make the final remarks. Yeah, so I have three main voting issues or three things that I think the round boils down to or reasons why you should vote pro and why universal health care is not a good thing. So I'll start off with um, the first voting issue, which is one of principles. And I feel like that this isn't going to be overly impactful to the judges, which is why it's the first one. If you don't share the same principles as me, so I'll start off with it, which is that universal health care undermines freedom. Uh, again, universal health care undermines freedom. And this is really one of the main issues that I personally, I know that's not impactful to everybody. It's probably not impactful to my opponent. Um, but it, it's, it's the fact that it, it takes away a lot of decisions that you as an individual can make. It takes away a lot of the choices that you can make, whether you know you want to follow a certain uh, health care provider or if you want to go to another health care provider. It, universal health care, you know, universal health care or a single payer system, whatever we're talking about, mm -hmm. takes away that opportunity to do that. Then my second voting issue is of the insane cost. Again, insane costs. So if you want, and I've talked about this briefly, if you want good treatment, 
you know, treatment that is as good as a free market system, you're going to need to have the insanely high taxes as I presented earlier. The reason that a lot of systems, and he brought this up himself at the start of the debate round, the reason that a lot of systems have bad quality healthcare is because they simply don't have enough money. So in order to compete with a free market system, in order to have the same level of treatment, you have to have insanely high taxes. And me personally, again, looking back at the first voting issue, um, a 40% tax increase is fundamentally wrong and unacceptable. A 40% tax increase across the board, it would be something like 60 to 80 for high income earners. It's an insanely high tax hike, all for the sake of, you'd end up paying the exact same amount with a lot of less options and a lot you know crappier care. Um, and I also use an empirical example underneath this of California. California, a couple months ago, tried to pass universal health care, and you know, the liberal leftist California, uh, they, they didn't even pass it because of the fact that it costs so much money. So these are the people in the United States. If there was ever a state in the US that would pass universal health care, it would be California. And they didn't even do it because of the fact that the costs were so high. You know, that, that that's telling that the fact that if you want good quality service, you have to have insanely high taxes. And if you have medium taxes, you kind of have crappy care as you've seen with other countries. Um, and then the third voting issue is, reason, is, is really the reason why you should vote pro, which is that the free market is preferable. Again, free market, is preferable. If you look at the case of Charlie, Charlie Gard, I am not implying, and I will never imply that Charlie would have been healed. I, I was never saying that. What I am saying is that under a free market system, the parents would have had the option to see if he could have been healed. Under socialized medicine, they never even had that ability. Underneath the NHS, they didn't even get the option to see if he would have been treated. They didn't even have the option to run the experimental treatment. Um, and, and then also my second sub point underneath this, and I'll pass this back to you, is that my opponent hasn't provided any exclusive advantages to universal health care. So let's look at the three systems that, we've, that, that have been presented and the advantages and, dis, and, and disadvantages of them. Uh, the, of the, let's first look at the free market. So there are two things that I really see inside of this. You have low taxes, good care, but you have to haggle with insurers. Okay, th that's two advantages and a disadvantage to that. Okay, then you have universal health care, which is you have, you know, medium taxes with kind of crappy care. And then you have, you know, full on single payer system where you have insanely high taxes. And, and, you know, it's debatable if it'd be good care, but generally speaking, it will be good care if you have insanely high taxes. And it is pros contention. And I would hope that it'd be your contention as a judge and as a person that you should always opt for the free market system because you have more opportunities. You have there's more competition in healthcare, a truly free market system. There's more competition in healthcare, you know, supply and demand, basic economic principle. It will drive the cost of things down because of the fact that more people want them. There's more innovation. There's more competition. There's competition. It drives costs down. So overall, what we will see is that the free market system provides a lot of the same advantages that my opponent talked about but with lower tax rates and overall better quality of care. And, and, and with that in mind, I'll pass the final remarks back to you. Cool. Pro. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so two minutes here. Um, basically, I think that my, my, the, my opponent hasn't addressed uh, sort of the, the shortfalls of the free market in addressing things like uh, pharmaceutical medications or necessarily the allocation problems that existed in the NHS, where you did have hundreds of people being redirected for public service because they simply couldn't care for them. While Charlie Garb was a regrettable case, yes, that probably points to you know the quality of medical advice, which can happen under both sides of the, of the debate here. Um, so I think on that broader principle thing there, in terms of the Bernie Sanders approach to uh, to universal healthcare, that probably does work in a, like a communistic society. Um, given that that wasn't in contention, I think, and at the start of this debate, we agree that a system where you had in private health insurance and, you, and public healthcare heavily subsidised in existence, I don't think that carries as much weight in this debate. Oh, my cat's just jumped up here. Um, but the other issue <laughs> as well, um, in terms of the, the broader like, access to medication, in that you do have, um, despite a lot of contention from my opponent on this, you do have a lessening of the waiting times in, in many scenarios, um, with the exception of Canada, but like eight countries outnumbering that. I've linked that in the comments section below. Um, again, and the broader access of cheaper medication, that is something which is crucial to, to the day-to-day -day care of individuals um, that necessarily were priced out of the market in the first place. Um, and, and in terms of the tax hikes, a tax hike as well, which is, I guess, the third issue I brought up at the start on the economic benefits here, at the point in time in which you can uh, necessarily reduce your budget deficit as what Obamacare was going to do, or in Australia, where you have um, 9% of your GDP. I think like America still spends 6% of its GDP. So it's really like in terms of what countries can do, it's a marginal increase in really the, the, the sort of qualitative controls that you get from that public healthcare system. 
um, that it's just much better having those day-to-day -day activities. Uh, in terms of the, the free market hasn't addressed the sort of issues like in inf uh, sort of infant mortality um, and life ex expectancy. Uh, I should have brought this argument up earlier, but again, in that same um, UHC article, there was a, a sort of like in India, in a province, Gujarat, which is, you know, they've tried the free market principle. 88% of families have been locked out of medical care because it just costs so much of their bill. I apologise that you, I know you didn't have a chance to respond to that earlier, but just um, in terms of the principal thing there. So I think at the end of the day, yes, while there are some things about universal health care that, that is regrettable at times because governments can't net uh, look after the, the insane amount of allocation that takes place about a Bernie Sanders system, it still provides a better mechanism for most people to go about their daily good, uh, like daily medications and also get access to those, those hospital systems in the first place to actually improve um, their, their insurance choices. A bigger issue in this debate was liberty and the, the freedom to choose. What universal healthcare has done is provide more people with better choices for their insurance. And for those reasons, uh, I think you should vote for me, but it's a good debate.